Now let's get into it on the other side. Hey, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to On the Other Side Leadership After Transition. I'm your host, Jeffrey Lodick. Hey, listen, if you notice something new, I got a new mic, right? So it's hanging down. I look like a podcaster now. I've been doing this for five years, and I figured, why not start now? It look, looking like I do something professionally. Anyhow, hey, listen, before we get started today, just want to just want to kind of give a shout out to some of my past guests and uh, want to kind of promote some things that they're doing, right? So the Transition Mission, Herb Thompson was on last week. I know y'all heard him. Hey, jump! This is a great book for transition service members. It's an easy read, good guide. Jump over there and check out Herb Thompson's Transition Mission, Military Career Transition Insights from the Employer Side of the Desk. Uh, Bill Kiefer, he was a guest a couple weeks back. I love this book, and I, I, I would recommend it to anybody that's going through the transition. Both are very good, uh, thorough books, and they're easy reads. At ease, a soldier's story of pers- uh, and perspectives on the journey to uh, an encore life and career. Hey, this is from uh, Colonel Rob Campbell, guest on my show about two years ago, but I read this book and I and I also believe that it's a wonderful book. All of them offer something that's wonderful to, to, to look through and it all gives perspective, right? Because I think that transition is a journey. It's not a one-stop shop and variables do exist. So, so check those out. And I appreciate these guys greatly for spending time with me on the show, providing me their books to read. And uh, it's great. Hey, listen, next week we have um, Mike Abrams, the four block founder will be on, which will be an amazing, uh, uh conversation because it always is with Mike, uh, Ernest Tyson, the following week, master personal trainer, this young kid, he's, he's a, I know I've known him for years and it's, he's making me very proud with the things he's doing in the Tampa area. Uh, he's like the official trainer on ABC action news. So he's just doing really good stuff. And, and I really want you uh, uh, to, for you to listen to him as he shares his transition story. Uh, today we're going to get to the to the point, right? So we got the SEAC retired. For, hey, that's a pretty amazing position to be in, right? For you that don't know what SEAC stands for, Senior Enlisted Advisor to the uh, Chairman of the Joint uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Huge deal, right? I mean, it's a huge deal. I mean, there's only been uh, four, right? And so so it's really interesting that he's here tonight. But there's so much that he's done to impact the careers of of many people and the lives of many people. And what he's doing in transition is pretty inspiring. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to bringing him on and, and having a great conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to bring him on. Uh, here he is, SEAC retired John Wayne Trucks. Hey, I'm going to give you your, some claps, man. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> we got it all. You, you, you don't see the people in my room right now, but uh, they're here, John. So it's great. They're all happy to hear, have you. Thanks for having me, Jeffrey. I'm. Uh, it's an honor to be here. That's great. I, I love the fact that you took the time. I want to share a little quick story real quick, because, uh, John, what I do often when I'm talking about transition to, to everybody, I mean, there's a million things, right? Do this, do this. There's a top 10 list. These are the top 10 things you need to do. And I always say networking is a big deal. So I just want to kind of share how this this connection happened. Uh, so so I had a, a, a guy, right, um, who who was my drill sergeant in basic training. So he and I have stayed in touch after years of being separate. He's in this area right now. And uh, I, I, he's a mentor to me. I looked up to him uh, greatly when, when I served. Well, anyway, he, he introduced me one day to Mark Halliburton. He was like, hey, you need to talk to this guy. He's, he's dynamic. He's a great speaker. And he knows that I'm a member of the National Speakers Association and that Mark was trying to get into some speaking stuff. So Mark and I connected and it was, I never met him before, but we shared a lot of similarities. There were things that were relatable in life, uh, career wise, life wise. And we really hit it off. I brought him on the show. We had a conversation. And then I, I started, I mean, I'd always seen you doing stuff uh, on, on LinkedIn and just the amount of traveling, the talking, the development, the leadership things that you did. You did a, a Monday morning, uh, like Monday morning podcast, like a motivational Monday thing that I'd seen every so often. And I was like, Hey, Mark, do you, do you know uh, the SEAC? Do you know who do you? he's like, yeah, I, I can reach out to him. I said, that'd be great. Uh, and he did. And I'll tell you, I think, I think the part that really motivated me was it was five minutes. From the time I said, "Hey, could you could you connect me?" to the time that you said I'd, I'd do your show is five minutes. I mean, it wasn't long. And to me, that's the power of a network. And I and I I really believe that that is at the heart of transition or anything in life, right? Is is it's the, not just who you know, but it's it's kind of who who knows you and why do they know you? So when Mark does call you or Mark reaches out on behalf of me, it's because there's a level of knowledge between the two of uh, you and him or you and me, right? That he has that he's willing to do that stuff. So I love it, and I really appreciate you taking your time to be here and just, you know, give us some insights on transition from your perspective and, uh, you know, go from there. So, so it's great. So, Hey, I don't want to talk about your 38 year career, right? Cause it's a long career. I mean, I, I read your bio and I swear, uh, it, it was about as long as Herb Thompson's book. Man, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so 
so, but I, I do I do want to highlight some stuff though because you've done some pretty amazing. I mean, historical uh, things, right? Not not just surf for thirty years. That's all well and good. But you did a jump into Panama. I mean, that's that, we haven't had a combat. I mean, there's been a few in my lifetime anyway, combat uh, airborne operations, and you were in one of them. Uh, which I've I've listened to you uh, describe it on different shows and different interviews, and even while you were still in the military, uh, just about how that was. And I, I kind of want to get into that like right then, because I don't want to say that transformed your career, but that was an early point of your career where, you know, combat wasn't something we were really doing at that time, right? So it kind of changed the mindset of not just who you were at that point in time, but the whole military in general kind of went through a transformation of, oh, we, we got to actually fight these things because they're they're coming, right? Yeah, so I mean, we were a peacetime military at the time, and uh, I had when uh, we did the jump. I had been in the army seven years, and uh, I had served in uh, heavy units and everything. And I just happened to be in the 82nd Airborne Division. That's where I found my home, and well, I really took on uh, the title of being a professional career soldier was in the 82nd. I had found my calling there. And uh, even when I was there, though, and you've served in airborne units, Jeffrey, you know, and we would do these simulated, uh, you know, alert, marshal, deploy, jump somewhere and come back and everything. So um, we had done it so many times that when the actual alert happened, now, don't get me wrong, things were going on in Panama at the time. You know, Noriega, you know, was not reelected and he refused to leave office in a peaceful transition with the uh, incoming president called around. And uh, then he started, uh, you know, bullying, not just uh, Panamanian citizens, but, you know, an American uh, Marine Lieutenant was killed down there. Uh, a, an American soldier and his family were assaulted by uh, the dignity battalions that were kind of Noriega's bodyguards and everything. And Americans were at risk now because of this unrest there. So we knew that was going on and even we even, pre-positioned a platoon out of my battalion down there uh, that was going to be part of the assault on the Papal Nuncia, or excuse me, excuse me, the Commandancia, which is the headquarters for the Panamanian military, Noriega's headquarters and everything. And it didn't hit me, you know, even when we got alerted, you know, I was a typical young NCO and, and, and I can't believe we're going to go do a training jump during half day schedule. They won't even give us our half day schedules and everything. And until we got over to the personnel holding area, my platoon sergeant and I, Dave Freeman, went in, uh, to the uh, Brigade Tactical Operations Center, just walked in like we owned it, and saw that the staff was laminating maps of Panama, and they were discussing doing a combat jump at 500 feet altitude and everything. And we knew then it was real. Mm -hmm. And that's when the instincts kicked in of relying on your training, getting focused and everything. And, uh, and there was no turning back. You know, and, and you remember at that time, there was no cell phones. Uh, and you remember at Fort Bragg that whenever there was an alert, the telephone lines would be shut off and everything. So my focus on, you know, I couldn't even let my wife know, know that I was going to combat. You know, I was just like, she's going to find out sooner or later that I'm in, in Panama fighting. So uh, we got focused and, uh, you know, got on the plane. We just did what we were expected to do and we what our training was. And it validated that we were doing things right. When we got on the ground, we were able to con conduct the airborne assault, get after the assault objectives, expand the lodgement into Panama City, and continue to take the fight to the Panamanian Defense Forces and the Dignity Battalions till ultimately, you know, they succumbed and surrendered or, or they ran away, you know. And then we finally cornered Noriega in the Papal Nuncia, you know, the, the chapel there in downtown Panama City, and that kind of uh, ended the the uh, the fighting there and everything. But I mean, this was a three week combat tour, which was, you know, kind of romantic, you know, because uh, came back and nine months after I got back, we had another baby. So <laughs> <laughs> you go to combat for three weeks, you kick the crap out of an enemy, you come back home, and all of a sudden, you know, it, it's time to have another kid. So um, what I took from that, though. I had already made the commitment in being a career soldier because I was serving in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was a proud paratrooper, proud NCO and everything. But coming back from that combat tour told me that we had to continue to get better every day at our craft. Because although 
you know, we did have some uh, sticky moments in Panama, you know, in terms of the enemy uh, attacking us and everything. And I ended up in a double ambush one night that we fought our way out of it. And only a few American troops got wounded and everything. But uh, it told me that combat can happen at any time. And it did seven months later when I was deployed to Desert Shield and ultimately fought in Desert Storm. And so that kind of transformed me into striving. I was already striving to be the best soldier I could be, the best leader I could be. But now I was striving to be as the best we could be in our mission essential tasks, our combat tasks, and our battle drills. And that stayed with me for the remainder of my career. No doubt. I mean, and, it's, and that's just an interesting thing because you've seen it right from the, the peacetime into the into the combat. We've actually, actually been in combat for quite a long time. And, you know, God bless all those that have since, uh, you know, raised their right hand to join while we're in combat. That's a, I don't know, uh, even for me, when I, when I'm, a, I'm a young kid coming out of Buffalo. And I, I know that you're from Davenport, uh, Iowa, which I got to tell you, I, I never even heard of Davenport, Iowa. And I mean, two years <laughs> later, I mean, being from Buffalo and all, but any. Anyway, and yeah. it's just interesting because, uh, you know, people are just raising their hand to come into a time, regardless if they, I mean, whether they know it or understand what combat really is, it, it doesn't matter in that, in that uh, frame of mind that they're still coming. And I, and I love it. I mean, that, those are some of the guys and gals that I, I was really happy to, to lead and, and took a lot of that personally because they, they were knowingly coming into a situation. When I came in the military, believe you me, I had heard it's a party, right? I mean, we're, we're going to party in this place. And it obviously <laughs> changed very quickly. But now that's really interesting. I want to, so I, I want to fast forward a little bit to your time. You get selected to be the SEAC, and that's really an amazing accomplishment. But I'm really impressed. Um, so I've, I listened to you speak on many occasions, right? And the one thing I, I think that you would have a great hand in if you ever wanted to is to be a geography teacher. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you speak very well about the world globally, but you even pronounce the names of the places, right? Because you'll say something, I'll be like, Man, I don't know if he knows what he's talking about. I'll, I'll Google it, right? And have it pronounced, but you're very worldly, right? I think what you epitomize to me um, is truly the enlisted force at some point in time early, right? Was just a bunch of guys who got together and did the work, pulled this, moved this, where officers kind of orchestrated and, and we did the the hard, hard jobs, right? The hard work. But over the last, my, my, during my career, I've seen a big shift in an education perspective mm -hmm. from the enlisted force, which look, I got friends of mine that have retired that are now doctors. Uh, I mean, and, and this is the enlisted side of the house that are, are have two, yeah. three master's degrees. And it's, and you epitomize that as, as we talk about that, um, and, and that helps not just in the in the military perspective, because now we can actually have those, you know, hard conversation with the with the senior officers to say, listen, I get it. I understand you're you're who you are, regardless of rank. I mean, you were with, you know, Secretary Mattis, who, by the way, is one of my biggest heroes. Like he's iconic. Right. As is what's patent way back in the day. And I'll get into that because I know you you said it, you said something kind of reiterating something he had said. And you caught some flack up at Capitol Hill because of it. But uh, but you really show that that level of education is important, not just for while you're serving, so you can have those conversations with your with your uh, command team, but as you're getting ready to exit the military, you're marketing yourself in such a manner that you are actually, not just your rank, because experience is good and thank you for serving means something, but now I can put all that together because now I have the requirements that you're requesting to be at whatever le level of you know C-suite or executive leadership because I have my master's or my doctorate. And that, that's really good. So you I just want to say I appreciate that you did that. You leaned forward because you are a very educated individual. If you don't mind, what made you? What was the, the turning? Because I, at the time when you started doing it, it wasn't really thought of or heard of. A senior enlisted guy carrying multiple uh, degrees, it wasn't something that we did at that point. What was what was your motivation to do those things? So I, I, I just had this conversation. You know, I'm doing some leadership seminar stuff here, as I mentioned to you. Uh, backstage before the show, Jeffrey, I'm in uh, the a, a headquarters on Joint Base Lewis McCord right now in their conference room doing this uh, show, uh, and I just talked about this. Uh, you know, at the tactical level, you know, when you have a company level officer, a lieutenant or a captain, and you have a senior NCO that might be an E7 or E8, the lieutenant generally has more formal education than the NCO. The NCO obviously has more experience. But the further you go up the ladder, that officer's experience starts to catch up. And if the NCO doesn't do something to broaden themselves, and people, 
I hear this all the time. Why do I need a college degree? I think, you know, what, what getting degrees for me, it broadened me as a leader, gave me more, uh, better cognitive skills, better critical thinking skills and everything. And think of this at the SEAC level. Now I am sitting in a conference room with the secretary of defense, the chairman, the vice chairman, and the joint staff directors, all the three stars. And when they come around, you know, when we're talking about, and we're not in there talking about, you know, tactical level stuff, we're talking about strategy, we're talking about national defense, and we're talking about, you know, what are we gonna do about to deter China and Russia and, and to continue to get after ISIS and things like that. And when they come to me, I better deliver something that is relevant to the conversation and that's something that the SECDEF and the chairman and the joint staff members can walk away with. And it cannot be associated with some tactical or, or level task like haircuts and cigarette butts or mold in the barracks. Don't get me wrong, that stuff is important and there's a place for it, but the, <laughs> the SECDEF and chairman aren't gonna go brief the president and tell him, we have, a, we have a problem with mold at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Mr. President. You know, mm -hmm. the president needs to know best military advice on how to get after the defense of our nation. Don't get me wrong, this stuff I'm talking about, I'm not trivializing it at the tactical level, that's important stuff that leaders have to get after. But I knew in order to be able to speak uh, relevantly and uh, intellectually at that level, that as I continued to grow up, I saw how my officer's experience was getting to the same as mine and their education was, and so I had to, continue to go out and do the things that I needed to do. And that's when I went and got my degrees and ultimately the, the master's degree uh, with a concentration in strategic leadership, would help, which helped me greatly in my role as the SEAC in being a better advisor to the chairman and SECDEF, but more importantly, being able to do those discussions at the White House, at the State Department, at Congress and things like that. Uh, that would give relevant information at the appropriate level to whoever I was talking to. I think it was absolutely important and it was part of my growth and development that allowed me to get to where I was at and ultimately to be successful at that level. And, and I don't doubt that. It's actually really interesting because I've had several conversations with industry folks right down here in Tampa as well as uh, San Antonio. And it's really interesting when you talk to folks that never served in the military and they have an idea. They, they have very minimal ideas of rank and how structure works, but they've heard terms. They know what general or colonel or private sergeant. They really don't understand sergeant major too much or chief master sergeant. But what is interesting is that when you have some level of military person with them, and if it's an officer, a lot of the things from the past that have crept into right now is if you want a sergeant major, he can tell you how to, you know, tighten up your 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 uh, your formation, if you will. They can help talk about haircuts. He could talk about all the things that which you made mention, which there is a time and a place for. But we get short changed a lot of times because of the fact that what used to be and what now are two different things. So trying to level that playing field will take time. But I, I'll tell you, I'm just really impressed with how I'm looking at senior leaders. Uh, the sergeants major that I talk to regularly, the chiefs and, and the master chiefs that they're coming out. Hell, uh, sergeant first classes and master sergeants uh, in the Air Force coming out with masters and, uh, and accepted into uh, doctoral programs. And I'm, I'm I'm amazed and I'm very happy that they're taking advantage of the, the military uh, uh, tuition assistance. They're doing the things they need to top up and all that other stuff to be able to walk out and be where they feel like they're valued and to understand that while they're still serving. So they aren't behind the, the eight ball when they do get out, because what you said was, I don't need a college degree. If I wanted a college degree, I want to join the army. And that's a great mantra because I said the same thing uh, when I joined the army. However, that was based on my senior leaders, not needing a degree. And, and obviously the army at that time wasn't looking for uh, educated. And I don't want to say educated, but I'm uh, military educated. Right. I mean, they were always telling me about go to this school, go to this school. And it was all tactically related. Right. But not educational wise from a, a, an actual institute. So I just I, I applaud so, you. So for Jeffrey. That. Yeah. 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 So think about this. Um, it was it was post Vietnam up until the end of the Vietnam War. We were a conscription military. We had a draft and everything and we were accepting non high school graduates. And we had no formal non-commissioned officer education system. The two most powerful things that happened to the United States military that allowed us to transform into being the number one 
partner of choice for global peace and security on planet Earth was we became an all-volunteer force and we started our non-commissioned officer education system. And now we had this formal education system to educate NCOs. Because up until then, as you described earlier, our non-commissioned officers were taught what to think. Our non-commissioned officer education system taught them how to think. And so knowing how to think means that, um, that you can be trusted and you can be empowered and you can execute disciplined initiative within commander's intent and accomplish missions without asking for permission, but more importantly, not being micromanaged. And all of that over the past 50 years has allowed us to morph the United States military and our, our enlisted force into what is now our greatest competitive advantage that we have over any threat. We have a lot of great partners out there and we've got a lot of tough adversaries, but none of them have the mid-level management in their non-commissioned officer and petty officer course like us. And in whatever environment we find ourselves in, whether against Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, or whatever, that will be that will be what saves the day. Because even though we may have a high-end, near-peer, decisive action fight, it's going to devolve into small unit kind of action. And those empowered, trusted, educated, trained, non-commissioned officers are going to be the ones that save the day and win the fight. And that is no doubt to be, uh, true. I mean, for anybody that served a day overseas to, with any other military, we definitely know that there is a significant lack of that middle management piece, the NCO Corps. We, we have one, and most people don't even understand or say, why do you let them do that, right? I've heard some officers that are in the – you're letting them brief. What are you? What are y'all doing? But it's different. It's just an interesting thing. So I want I want to fast forward to your time as a SEAC. And you, when when I believe it was when sec, uh, the Secretary of Defense, when Mattis came out of retirement and became the Secretary of Defense, he he changed the word in which we used, which was he used the word annihilate, annihilate our enemy. I mean, there was a, some some words that we used to that whether it be in the in the government perspective from Congress or from the president even. But there was there was. It was like they were talking with with white gloves. They were they didn't want to be get dirty. But uh, uh, Mattis had said, "Annihilate the enemy," and you echoed that. And and man, you got a lot of flack. And I will tell you, and this is not because of Black History Month. I'll say this because I use it twelve months of the year. But uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, "A, a genuine leader is not a, a searcher for consensus, rather a molder of consensus." <laughs> right? And and I love yeah. that saying because that's sometimes you're gonna not please everybody when you say some things, but no, you, when you have soldiers that want to, I mean, we want to hear that. I mean, that's what, when you say something like that, we're right. I mean, we know what you mean and we're ready to roll. However, it wasn't taken so, uh, so kindly, I guess at some other levels, cause there was some, there was some pushback from, uh, from the Capitol Hill. Can you tell me a little bit about, about the flack that you got? Cause I, I understand where you came from, um, as a soldier, uh, just kind of, kind of go from the other side. What, what you, what we didn't see, right? Yeah. So you mentioned it, Mattis came in and he said, we are going to annihilate our enemy. Any any threat to the United States of America that causes us to go to the war, we are going to annihilate them. We're not just going to defeat. We are going to annihilate. And that was his narrative. And as I, you know, I traveled with him um, as I did with General Dunford and, and then got out on my own. But whenever I would travel with Mattis, he would talk about this annihilation and he would run down the national defense strategy. And I wanted to put it in terms uh, you know, I think as, as, a, as a leader, and especially a leader that may have to lead in combat, the two most important things you can do is inspire your troops and intimidate the enemy, you know, okay? And if you cause the enemy to surrender because you were prepared to, you know, take the wood to them and you were telling them that and all of a sudden they backed off and said, okay, we're going to give up, then I think you've accomplished the mission at minimal cost to your force or to loss of life, you know? So... Um, when Secretary Mattis was talking about annihilating, I talked about our enemies had specifically ISIS had two options, surrender or die. You know, and we're a peace loving nation. If they surrender, we'll treat them humanely and give them all the things, you know, that they need, you know, food and uh, a, a place to sleep and a detainee cell and due process uh, within the rule of law. But if, if they chose not to surrender, then we were going to kill them. And that, that was going to be with extreme prejudice, whether that was dropping bombs on them, shooting them in the face, or beating them to death with our military shovels, our entrenching tools. And I did it to inspire the troops to let them know that we in Washington, D.C., and the senior leadership of the DOD 
knew the tough things that were going on in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, places like that, mm -hmm. Colombia and South America, on the Korean Peninsula and stuff like that. And we hadn't forgotten the hard work that they were getting after. <clears throat> and so when I said that, it had the desired effect on the troops, as you described. But all of a sudden, some members of Congress were critical of me saying that. Um, and uh, there were some folks in the Pentagon, some general flag officers that didn't like what I said. There were some peers in terms of other E-9s that didn't like what I said. There were retired E-9s and officers that uh, didn't like what I said. I even had one admiral come to me and say, you know, you realize enlisted people are supposed to be seen and not heard. And that was, uh, that, was a, th that guy almost got a, a butt whooping right there. Okay, that right there, because <clears throat> we are so far removed from that as we were describing because of our education system, because of the empowerment and the trust we put in our NCO. And so, <clears throat> but the key thing is, Mattis told me to keep saying it. Dunford was with me most of the time when I was saying it. And so when somebody would criticize me, especially if they were a general or an admiral, I would say, you can walk down the hallway there to that four stars office known as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs staff, knock on his door or go upstairs one floor to the secretary of defense's office and knock on his door and tell him you don't like what I said. And again, um, <clears throat> I think as a leader, you can't be afraid. You have to have intestinal fortitude to say or do what is right or what is needed at the appropriate time, excuse me, to defeat potentially a white glove narrative that you talked about. <coughs> As you know, Jeffrey, trying to talk about combat with kid gloves in something that is brutal and unforgiving is like putting lipstick on a pig. You know, you, it just doesn't match. And so the realities of combat, the realities of the sacrifice that the men and women of the U.S. military are making on any given day, I wanted to make sure that stayed at the forefront of our congressional legislation in terms of our defense bills, uh, in terms of the administration, and then how we collaborated with other departments in the administration. So I said it, and I wasn't going to walk it back, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't walk it back. And here we are today, you know, that... Um, here I am two years removed from a service and three and a half years removed from saying that. And I'm still signing entrenching tools uh, every day. And I'm up to over 2,100 of these things that I've signed. And the point is, people look at that entrenching tool now as a symbol of living a warrior ethos that men and women join the military to, to be a part of. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, as you know. And they want to be labeled this warrior and everything. And so don't, you know, the, the message I was sending is we are not going to dumb down <clears throat> what we expect men and women to do uh, against uh, enemies of the United States. And we are not going to marginalize, <coughs> excuse me, the sacrifices that they make in doing that. So I caught a lot of flack. Ultimately, it led to some other things that caused me to get suspended and uh, and I because of an IG complaint that said I was hostile and toxic and I used torturous language and uh, all these other things. <clears throat> Ultimately, I came out of that thing uh, reinstated uh, by General Dunford and I was able to finish off the last year plus of my time. But even when I was suspended, Jeffrey, uh, I was not going to walk away. People were telling me, why don't you just retire? Why are you putting up with this? Well, again, I go back to the hypocrisy. I'm telling the troops to deal with adversity and be hard in it and, and, you know, push through it and be a better leader, soldier, person on the other side. And I would have been a hypocrite if I would have said, oh, you're going to pull this on me? I'll just quit. No. So I told the chairman <clears throat> when I got suspended, I said, I know the IG, the DOD IG is going to have to do this investigation and the Army is going to have to do this investigation. But there's only two ways I'm leaving, chairman. You either fire me or you reinstate me and I finish out my time. I'm not quitting. So I don't care if you make me sit down here for years, I'm going to persevere. And so all of that was designed to be an example for the troops. And even though that six months that I was suspended was pretty arduous for me and my family, uh, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, at times like that, Jeffrey, you really know who your friends are because some of those folks 
started walking away from me. And unfortunately, there were some general officers in there and flag officers that used to talk to me all the time. <clears throat> but when I got suspended, they wouldn't talk to me at all. And then when I got reinstated, all of a sudden they wouldn't be friends again. I said, oh, no. Oh, no, we're not going down that road. So my mm -hmm. message in all of that is, you know, as a leader, you have to have the, the intestinal fortitude to say what needs to be said in terms to inspire the troops, let them know that we truly care about them. And in the end, if that message, although it's legal, moral, and ethical, is not popular by other members outside of it, then you can't succumb to that flack. You got to push on. And that's what I tried to do. And that's ultimately what I did. And, uh, you know, I think I'm a better person for it. I'm definitely a better leader. And it's certainly helped me uh, post-military life. Yeah, it, it's again, it's great. As a matter of fact, I uh, saw Major Matt Jacobs. I told him I'd, I'd say this out loud. So if, you're, if he's watching, so he, he's a SOCOM J6 Sergeant Major. He said, man, I need one of those shovels. I, I get a sign up. I'll drive it to him. So anyway, uh, uh, hey, that's the shout out for Matt Jacobs. Um, but I, I'll tell you it's, what's in. So I, I correlate a lot of stuff um, with sports. I, 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 I'm a sports guy. So I, I kind of mesh the love I have with the military with sports. And it's funny because I'm a Bills fan. And Buffalo played Jacksonville, who arguably was the worst team in the NFL this year. They lost the game nine to six. And and I and I wondered to myself during during that game, I'm listening to you as you're talking about the shovel and and people. I, I read some comments from non-military people that were just ridiculous about it. Anyway, why would they use a shovel? Well, if that's what you got, that's what you got. Uh, but anyway, I I wondered to myself. I said, man, I wonder if the Jacksonville Jaguars leadership sat down with these guys and said, listen, this is your Super Bowl. This is what you have to do, and you have to beat them at any means necessary. Meanwhile, the highly favored, but actually the largest point spread that lost all year, I don't know if it's been in five years, but at least this year, they lost, right? And I'm wondering if they were looking to the next game. They weren't focused. They didn't have that, that drive because, look, no one's telling Tom Brady, hey, listen, you're playing Jacksonville or Josh Allen, you're playing Jacksonville, so just take it easy. You know, they're not. They, they want to get going, right? So I look at that from a military perspective. We need leaders. You need leaders to be be motivating you to do these things because why? That If you never spent a, a second in combat, you have, no one knows what it really takes, right? So when you have someone that, especially with your experiences throughout 38 years of service, when, when that guy – says something you're, you're you're waking up the army right you're waking up the marine corps and, and it's it's a big it's a big shot across the bar to say hey let's go we're doing it so it was, it's a great message and i'm glad you didn't back down from it because we who were receiving the message uh we we heard it loud and clear and it was great so so let me ask you this uh john so when you when you so it's 30 you're you're approaching 38 years you know it's time based on you, you can't go anywhere else i mean it's, it's it you're, you've got to the end of the road it's time to to make this transition you know, a lot of folks get get concerned with employment. That's their number one uh, 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 concern because obviously you've created a livelihood throughout eight years, ten years, twenty years, thirty eight mm -hmm. years of service uh, with that income. So we concern ourselves with a job. Um, but the thing that I think we fail to concern ourselves with is what is life really like for me when I no longer am the SEAC, when I'm no longer in charge of, when I no longer have these conversations with Secretary Mattis or General Dunford or, or whomever it may be, what, what do I, it, it, there's a, something that happens in our mind and are we able to kind of transform, you know, and take this uniform off and then go and do something else, no matter, even if it's similar to, I kind of want to walk through that with you uh, as far yeah. as wh where's the mindset at for you after all this time of transition, right? And, and kind of what was your process prior to actually exiting? Yeah. So I think all of us, as you just described, Jeffrey, um, we're, we're institutionalized by being in the military. We are part of, we know that if I'm sick, I can go to the military treatment facility. If my family is sick, they can go to the medical treatment facility at the hospital or whatever. Um, I know I'm going to get paid twice a month. I know that uh, I'm going to have structure in terms of my work schedule and everything. Um, <clears throat> But as you so when you get ready to transition and you you're going to lose that structure and that institutionalization, there's going to be anxiety there and there's going to be a certain level of fear that you're moving into the unknown. And, you know, as I even as I got ready to transition, you know, I was asking others that were already on the other side that were retired and a good friend of mine who's, you know, a retired command sergeant major Randy Woods. Um, he was already on the other side. So he was already had a job 
you know, he was already getting his retirement. He was already getting VA disability. He was, he was, his stuff was done. And this reminded me of when I was getting ready to go to ranger school and I would talk to guys that just graduated and I would try to put in perspective, they've already got their tab. They're on the other side. Um, they don't have to go through this, but I have to go through it now. And I tried to liken it to that and tried to, you know, pattern what I was doing like I was getting ready to go to ranger school. Now, it was hard for me because I got a chair, a new chairman in September of 2019, Mark Milley. And so General Milley and I were together for my last five months. And, you know, when he came in as the chairman, he was bright eyed and bushy tailed. He ready to get after, you know, the best military advice of the president. And he comes into my office and says, hey, look, we're going overseas. We're doing this and that and everything. And um, and I and I lived like we all do by this attitude of I'll figure it out when I get there at transition. And so I think that figure it out when I get their attitude for military missions, especially in combat, sometimes that's effective. But when it comes time to transition, it's not the attitude to have. And I was the I was I did it the wrong way, thankfully, because I was the SEAC. I had a staff that helped me. You know, I had a great NCO, uh, Sergeant First Class Chantel Dela Cruz Johnson that took care of me and got all my appointments and stuff so I could still travel with the chairman and do the things I needed to do. But I didn't prepare like I did to, and specifically, mentally and emotionally, I wasn't preparing. But, you know, when I did the change out with the current SEAC, you know, um, CZ Colon Lopez, the minute we did the ceremony, um, all of a sudden, it was like this weight was lifted off of me. And I didn't have to worry now about the force so much. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, I wasn't automatically like, oh, you guys are on your own and everything. But I knew this guy had the, he had the operation now. I could focus on me and my family and everything. And I did that. And then as I went through my transition course, I gained confidence that I felt I could compete on the outside in terms of uh, being an entrepreneur. Because uh, I did not want to do the generational stereotypical things that some sergeants major do, you know, and, and I wanted to do my own thing and I was going to put forth the effort, the motivation to get out and get after that. And, uh, I've had some bumps and bruises out here. It hasn't always been beer and Skittles like it is for everybody, but, uh, you know, things are going well for me right now. And, uh, the family is happy. And so I can't complain. That's outstanding. So it's really interesting. So what, what I try to do and the, the, to the best of my ability, right, on this show specifically, is I try to make every guest I have relatable to somebody. What I mean by that is, look, we have people that watch. I have people listening. I mean, there's usually about a thousand folks, maybe a little bit more, depending on who. But I, I, there's a pretty wide audience. And, and it's interesting because I always know that not everybody that I'm, that's talking here, somebody out there can relate to, but somebody can relate. So so to, at, to ask the question, especially when I talk about networking and I say, hey, you know, the SEAC, I'm sure his network is is far more vast than many. So is there an advantage to being that? Sure, that there's an advantage. But I think, but I think at the end of the day, one, how to use it. And then two, more importantly, the thing that makes you relatable is the fact that you're doing something from an entrepreneurial perspective that there are a lot of folks trying to do that aren't successful and some that are, but you're also going through the transformation from I, I was in the army, I was the SEAC. Now I am just John Wayne Troxel. And that name carries some weight. Don't get me wrong. We can understand it. But the thing that doesn't, it doesn't matter is inside your head makes us all kind of even, right? When it comes down to it is that kind of breaks down because employment is, is a thing. It means I get money so I can maintain a lifestyle, which is a stressor and I get it. But there are some things that when you want to go outside, uh, John, with, with, with the guys, or the gals, whatever unit you're in. And you want to be like, hey, I want to walk up to this formation and call everybody to attention and, and let's do some PT. Now you have to be invited. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like before where you could just, I mean, you could just go, don't, don't, don't go wrong. We know you just didn't walk up to people's formation. However, Are you there, Jeffrey? I am. Did you, did you lose me? Uh-oh. If we're having some trouble, I, I can hear you. If you can't hear me, then I'll just ramble on for a minute. I'll tell you what, hey, for anybody watching, throw a comment up and see and let me know what we're what we're doing right now. Cause I think he disconnected. There he is. Yeah, right there. I can hear you. It's good. Hey, hey, look, I'll tell you, for all y'all listening, 
John's traveling. He's he's got his like own RTO. It's himself, and he's doing this stuff on the go. He's got his little pocket, so it's good. Hey, you, you're only yeah. I got my own yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect, and and it came back real clear. So no, it's perfect. Um, but yeah, I just think that it's it's good to relate to you, right? I mean, so there's there's stories that you you and I talked about minimally right before we started, and there's things that I look at to say, hey, how how do I? Because I'm not, I'm not the SIAC. I, I don't have the clout of the SIAC, and a lot of folks that are watching are not going to have that. But the one thing we do have is we were we were service members, right? And and there are those trials and tribulations. I want to go into the idea of entrepreneurship with you, and then and kind of because there's a lot of folks. I, I deal with a lot of uh, business owners that are are veterans, and, and uh, man, they're killing it out there, which I which I'm so proud of. And I got a couple of guests uh, at the end at the end of this month and next next month, and that's yeah. their, their businesses. So tell me a little bit about one, why you decided I want to do the business as opposed to working for somebody and going through the project management yeah. like that number of things. And then tell me kind of a couple of those bumps along the way that you've kind of had to work through to, to, to get to where you're at now. Yeah. So I just knew after 38 years in the military and, uh, you know, four years as the SEAC and being on the road 270 days out of the year all over the world and everything that um, when I came back, I didn't want to grind. You know, a grind in terms of I have to come into an office every day. I have to report to somebody and, and everything. Uh, I wanted to do my own thing. I kind of wanted I wanted my office at home. And I wanted to, you know, kind of do the things that I had traditionally done, which has been an advisor and everything. So I started my own consulting firm, uh, PME Hard Consulting. And right now I consult for nine different companies. Um and I do everything from, you know, consult, I'm a strategic advisor <clears throat> or a brand ambassador, something like that. And uh, so, and then I think we all know that, you know, people talk about the five-year plan after you retire. Um, your personal brand, generally, whoever you are, has about a five-year shelf life. And then people start forgetting about who you are. So, uh, I'm on year three now and uh, my calendar is packed. Okay. And, but that's, that's my personal decision. You know, I don't fault anybody if they want to retire and they just want something easy, as you said, you know, keep the same lifestyle I had when I was on active duty in terms of pay and everything. And I'll be happy. That's fine and dandy. But I wanted to go out and see how I could do in this corporate world and continue to get after things that I wanted to get after. So I, I have done a lot of good things. And for uh, six of these uh, <coughs> um, companies that I consult for or advise, I've been with them now for over two years. Two companies that, you know, that I did work for. Uh, one of them, which was a film company that I was a military advisor for, they fired me because I couldn't, I and the CEO couldn't get along. Now, Jeffrey, that's, you know, when, when somebody brings you in and tells you they're, they're firing you, I don't care who you are or what you've done, that has an impact. And so I, I kind of took that, yeah, as a learning point on how can I make sure that this doesn't happen again. In the end, I mean, it didn't affect me financially, you know, it didn't, wasn't a huge impact financially or anything, but where I'm at now, um, I was able to create the eTool Nation uh, apparel and gear line. And, and then I was, you know, I'm using the SEAC rank. You know, some people, when I first started this and I started putting the SEAC rank on shirts, people accused me of trademark infringement. Well, you know, I'm a smart guy that does my homework. And I reached out to the Army uh, Trademark Office. And what I found out was that none of the military rank is trademark. You can put it on anything you want, you know? And some people didn't like that I was using it. And when I put the facts in front of them <clears throat> and showed them that I wasn't doing anything illegal, they wanted to come back to me and say, well, we don't like you doing that. I said, look, I gave you the facts. I'm not gonna succumb to your feelings. But my point in all of this, Jeffrey, is I wore the Army SEAC rank for all of 10 days on active duty. General Milley pinned it on me and uh, and it's synonymous with me. No other army uh, sergeant major has ever worn the SEAC rank. So, and people were reaching out to me, hey, we want the SEAC rank associated with your apparel and everything. So now I use the E-Tool Nation apparel and gear line to, 
to bring in money that I give, every dime that I get, I give to a charity. So I just recently gave $2,000 to a, an organization, Downrange Excursions, that helps veterans with PTSD and takes them on exotic hunting trips. I'm about to give another significant donation to the Lighthouse for the Blind. And I'm continuing to give $500 here to a charity or, or someone is doing something. And I've even gone this far now, Jeffrey. I sponsor three veteran athletes right now with eToll Nation with financial uh, support and everything. And all I ask them to do is to wear my logo on there. That two of them are MMA fighters and one is a power lifter. And all I ask them to do is wear my logo on their, their uh, uniform and on their banners. And, uh, and I'll take care of expenses for them and everything. This is all unorthodox stuff for Sergeant majors to do. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately in this world we live in, there's people that take offense or are jealous that of these endeavors. Now, here's the other thing, you know, you see me wearing this lead jacket here. This is, you see, it's got the E9 in the middle. So myself and a retired command chief out of the Air Force, Tim Chachi Pachesa, oh, oh, by the way, who is the director of partnerships for Black Rifle Coffee, have come together to build this lead uh, personal development program that assist at getting after leadership training uh, for the military, for business, and all kinds of other things. And so I just, when I left the military, I wanted to get after my own path. I wanted to do things that would make life more comfortable for my family, build some generational wealth that I can pass on to my grandchildren, have this personal family company, which now my wife and I run, and my youngest son is the chief operating officer for it that will continue to build on our family and everything. <clears throat> so I took the less beaten path that others do and it's had its ups and downs and I've dealt with it and everything. The worst thing I have to do is I got to pay tons of money to the government on taxes, you know, because, you know, for 38 years in the military, I always got a tax return. Okay. Well, now, I mean, Every quarter, I'm writing a check, a five-figure check to the dang government for taxes. But like my accountant says, you want this problem. I inherited the problem, so I accept it, and it comes with the territory from what I'm doing. So my message to, to your audience is when you get ready to transition, um, one, be confident in your transition that good things are going to happen to you out there, but dream big on what you want to do, but dream big, but set lofty and attainable goals that you can achieve. All right. And then visualize yourself going through the steps of reaching those goals and then actualize it, go do it. And, and if you continue to build a network, um, you rapidly transition your military reputation. that's built based on selfless service into a marketable personal brand that's attractive to businesses and corporations. And then you take your evaluations that you've received on active duty and translate that into a resume that can be understood by civilians in corporate America. If you do all of those things, it equals opportunity. And I don't care if you got out after four or five years or if you stayed 38 years, there will be opportunity out there for you and you just got to go get it. You know, it's interesting that, that you said earlier when you were talking about being fired and you talked about it, 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 it hits you, right? And I think that's what's an interesting thing. And I think that makes it a little bit more relatable. And it's not just about fired. It's it's rejection in general. I think that a lot of us in the military, and let's, let's not, promotion lists come out. Maybe we make it, maybe we don't. People have gotten passed over in there. That's a heart-wrenching feeling when you look at your peers and you're like, I'm better than that guy. I put 10, I, I work 10 times harder or whatever you say, right? And, and, yeah, but, yeah. Then you, but you also get promoted and then you move on and, and we don't get fired too often. And people that get fired in the military usually don't last very long because they're fired. Right. But at the end of the day, right. it's really interesting that there is a, a, a when you send your resume and when you have an interview, when you do all of these things and someone says no <laughs> or you're not good <laughs> enough or they don't even return your call or, hey, listen, you're here. Now you're fired. 
that is a huge punch to the to the chin, right? That's an ego check, and we and we struggle uh, as veterans about ego, regardless. I mean, we're we're in a very competitive organization. The, the military is the most competitive organization that I believe, anyway, that exists. And so when we do get out there and we have these, I don't want to say delusions of grandeur because we compare our like you got out and you're a project manager, you got out and you're a business owner, and you're making X dollars. I should get out and make X dollars. And that's cool. That's comparing yourself, you know, keeping up with the Joneses or whatever they call it. Um, but at the end of the day, when we when it doesn't work out, it's it's a huge shot. And I believe that um, the network can help. I mean, it really can. It's as you develop this network, and it's not just about can you get me a job. It's about hey, what are your what are your sources? Well, who do you know out there that may be looking for me? And we don't think about specific. We're looking for big companies, right? But we're not looking at at John uh, John Troxel's. Uh, um, organization. Maybe you're looking for a leadership development guy or Gail. Maybe you're looking for someone who does social media marketing, but we don't look at that. We look at, you know, big name companies, like Nike, Pepsi, or whatever, whatever, Comcast, you know, Hollywood, whatever. And, and I think that if we peel back, Jen, and there's so many organizations out there that could, I mean, the big organizations can use us too, but man, there's so many that would just use you and do well with it if you took the opportunity hey hey uh i'm not, I'm not sure if you do you travel have you been down to the tampa area at all recently oh yes okay yeah i uh well it was about a year ago i was down there but uh I, i've made two trips in retirement down there uh okay since uh since i left the military so what I want to do next time you come, I'd love for you to shoot me a note you're coming. I'd love to put you in touch with Valerie Ellis Lavin, Rosie, uh, Rosie Lee. They are the, uh, Rosie is the founder of Action Zone. Valerie works with Action Zone. She's a co-founder. And then they also do Bunker Labs. Um, they Obviously, they both do similar things. They're, 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 they're really helpful for veteran entrepreneurs. And I love it because there, there's so many resources that exist. For, for a veteran who is trying to oper own and operate a business. And sometimes we, we feel as though I don't want to start a business because I don't know the first thing about starting this when there are so many folks around this nation that will give you 30 minute consultations for free that talk about the legal, the accounting, the, the basic things. And then there's so many organizations that are like, here, <laughs> Let, do this, right? And it's it's just, it's one of those things. So I definitely want to put you in touch with them because one, I'm sure you could share some of your wisdom with them. And then two, th they, they may be able to help it, uh, scale your business a little bit or, or at least bring it into the Tampa area because of the fact that they're well-connected. They, they know the pulse of business in this area. Um, one last thing before we do go, I want to tell you, I've, I, I've been doing this podcast now for five years. Um, I, I took off a year because I was working on another podcast that I'll be launching here shortly that has nothing to do with the military, but I, I was working on that and it was, it was pretty tough. But when I came back to doing this, I came back to doing this for multiple reasons. One was because I kept getting emails like, Hey, are you not going to play any episodes? We really like listening to the transition stuff. We get good information, not from me, from all y'all, right? It's not, it's not my voice they like, but I was very, I wanted to be very intentional with the guests in which I brought in, I wanted to be very supportive of those guests. So with eTool Nation, if I can buy a t-shirt, I'll buy a t-shirt. I'll, I'll wear it on my show to promote it. But if I can help and in, in, in to get your message out there further, I want to do that. I mean, it's not, I mean, obviously uh, we all do a piece and I'd love to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reciprocating you taking your time to spend with me and, and my audience to just give us great insight. But more importantly, to thank you for I mean, for doing that and just saying, hey, good luck with everything you're doing moving forward. So I just wanted to make sure you know that I'm very excited and thankful that you came on and shared some time with us, John, tonight. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you so much. And I got to give a shout out to one of my athletes, uh, former uh, Army National Guard MP, Cody Jenkins. He fights for Rocket Sports in Virginia. And on the 19th of February, he's got a fight coming up. He's training hard. He is an eTool Nation and PME Hard sponsored athlete. He wears it proudly and everything. So, Cody, go get him. Know that we got you here, and uh, and we're going to take care of you. And uh, you just go kick the guy's butt and, uh, and, and keep after it. So, Jeffrey, thank you so much for having me, too. Uh, I really appreciate what you do, um, these kinds of shows, and especially with who you are and the voice you have are important, and they make an impact on people's lives. So it's been an honor to be here with you today, brother. I appreciate it greatly. Hey, so listen, if you need anything from me, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll be watching you from a from a fan perspective, and I'll keep, hey, listen, my son is a huge MMA fan. I, I, I watch it with him, but he's more into it. I used to be into it back in the day, but I'll tell you what, we'll be out there rooting for him. So go, Cody. I appreciate you. I'll, I'll make sure to uh, 
post some links into our comment to where they can find some stuff from you from from e tool nation more about about all that stuff but hey, hey i truly appreciate it. go go teach some guys out there at jblm how to how to be leaders and and i, I really i really thank you uh so much uh uh SEAC retired. Oh, by the way, I just want to tell a quick story. Hey, for all of you that listen, I called him John a couple of times, right? And I want to tell you. So years ago, I had, I think it was my fourth guest. I had a uh, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack Tilly on, right? And and Jack comes to the to the library because I live we live relatively close. So I have him in a library doing our interview. And he got there and I'm like, hey, Sergeant Major of the Army. He's like, nah, just call me Jack. I'm like, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack. And, and it's because uh, I, I knew uh, Sergeant Major uh, Tilly from when I was, I was a young kid in the Army, right? So in yeah. other words, it, it got a little bit more smooth. So then when I, I'm, I'm getting ready to talk to you, I'm like, I, I don't want to just assume because I'm not that guy that couldn't wait to get out of the Army. So I call every general officer by their first name or every Sergeant Major by their first name. But I asked I asked him and he told me, just so you know, so you don't think I'm being disrespectful to the SEAC. But anyway, John, it was great, great to talk to you. And, um, and we'll talk again. Um, is Absolutely, any- Jeffrey. I look forward to it. And maybe we'll get you on the eTool Nation podcast. How about that? Let's do it. I'm, I'm game. Oh, let, we'll just me, have a good old time. Yeah. And let me let me end this with this one last thing. So you're right. And I want to point that out. Hey, for anybody that's trying to start a podcast or, or, or anything, let me know. Let me see if I can help. If you need a guest for a podcast, let me know. I'll come on. And that's not because I'm trying to get my name out or anything like that. But here's the thing that I tell you. I've been doing this for five years. I've had one person, I'm not going to name no names, I don't care, that, that the first question they asked was, what's my listenership? Who, how many people do I have? To me, it doesn't matter. If I'm your first guest or your first guest on your right. show, I'll come on your show because at the end of the day, your voice matters and I, and that person will never be on my show because it doesn't matter because my audience isn't his. And, and at the end of the day, if we're trying to lead by example, this show is called On the Other Side, Leadership After Transition. We're trying to lead the way. So anyway... That's why I love the fact that you called right back, John, five minutes later, and we're on the show. Hey, I appreciate you. Have fun out there, and uh, I'm here for you whenever you need anything from me. Thanks, brother. Take care, Jeffrey. It's been an honor. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. That's a wrap for today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and tuning in to listen to SEAC retired John Troxel. Next week, Mike Abrams will be our guest for Block Founder huge huge conversation coming up so anyhow i really appreciate it if there's any comments that you have don't hesitate to put them in the in the place uh in the little comment place like share let people know that you watched it was a great conversation i really appreciate the SEAC for taking his time and spending it with us tonight um until next time i'll check you all out on the other side <laughs>